Right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, to start, actually, I just want to thank Alex for including me as a part of this day and this project, um, which is fantastic. I think I'm really getting a lot out of everything, including Gregor's paper this yes, morning. I'm I know. So sorry. You can't speak out, can you now? <laughs> This stupid clock screen turn takes a million years to uh, <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Really we had a good chat about interdisciplinarity and, and the, 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 the fact that I was surprised to find so many um, ways of thinking overlapping with the geneticist in his paper this morning. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Um, much like Lainey, I come from a very interesting disciplinary background and that my first degree is history and my degree since then have been in archaeology. But I am employed by a history department, as you see. Um, so my, my approaches and my methods and, and how I've always done my research has been, um, I would say, interdisciplinary by almost necessity, depending on what room I'm in. So telling building stories. Um, to start, we need to think about the fact that a building is more than material culture. So like any other piece of material culture we have from the 11th century, it's a means to see people, and sometimes even individuals if we're lucky. I know I'm preaching to the choir in the room to end this. But I think buildings provide us with a really interesting opportunity to marry the two in the best possible circumstances, as some of these buildings obviously have related records. So we know who was here sometimes. And I don't just mean necessarily the lord or the lady of the manor. Sometimes we are lucky enough to know the names of slaves, servants, household members, though I grant you this is rather the exception to the rule. But it is these exceptions then that allow us the chance to get closer to a wider stretch of society in these times. It allows us to try to know not just the people in the place, but the experience, if viewed very carefully, thoroughly, and dare I say, perhaps a little creatively. So the main point I want to talk about today is interdisciplinarity and in looking at medieval buildings. So this is also nothing new. I stand on the back of giants in this field, as I'm well aware. What I'd like to sort of ruminate on and, and possibly propose if I'm that bold um, is a way of thinking about buildings in order to tell their stories, by which I mean both the story of the building itself as well as its people. It's an approach that allows for a lot of uncertainty, which I'm absolutely fine with, although I know it that won't be universally approved. I've had a lot of rather stringent, and I'm happy to say they're very respectful conversations with both historians and archeologists in terms of my approach. It is not universally applicable. It will not be universally accepted. And I'm postmodern enough in my approach to say that's okay. This is one way of doing, there are others and they should all coexist, I think. So my theoretical approach when it comes to medieval buildings are fixed between three main points. Firstly, concepts of space, place, and time, which then allows for the next two, biography and spatial analysis. So in an interpretive sense, the latter two rely on the first in order to anchor interpretations and understandings of these buildings, places, and people. And to be slightly more specific at the moment, my approaches are influenced by de Soto, the practice of everyday life from 1988, but also with a pretty heavy Susan Henri Lefebvre, the pro uh, production of space. Spatial analysis, a la Hillier and Hansen, 1985, though adapted to take into account more factors than what sort of the pure concepts of space as they describe it. And biography from Harold Mitem, actually ex of this institution, and particularly his 2010 article in Post Medieval Archaeology. And of course, I have to acknowledge, especially in this room, that the shape of my research really very much found its infancy here as well, particularly with guidance from Kate Giles, John Finch, Jane Grenville, all of whom played a, a large part in sort of helping me try to form up some nebulous thoughts even in those early days. So to start with space, place, and time, de Soto maintains that place is where elements are distributed and a relationship of coexistence, so roughly quoting here. It excludes the possibility of two things being in the same place. Elements are situated in proper and distinct locations and it is a location that it then defines. It is an instant configuration of positions and applies an indication of stability. So roughly end quote. So a place here is more affixed. So it's the immobility of a street layout over a long period of time, as Kobiaka says in his example, or building, shall we say, which is intended to stand over a long period of time as well. So even if altered at times, creates an affixed place onto which space becomes mapped as a part of time and movement. So then space, to just exists when you add in these mobile elements. Space occurs as the effect produced by the operations that orient it, situate it, and temporalize it. So a space is fixed within a place, materiality, and I think very importantly, time, 
as space can change rather more easily than a place with the movement of objects and the introduction of another person's experience into it. So these definitions, as de Soto would see it, make spaces out of places. Places being somewhat more secure, but spaces being more fluid and defined by a system of interlocking vectors. The material, the temporal, with people perhaps being the most unstable of all the vectors in a place. And Michelle Kobiaka zeroes in on de Soto's idea by maintaining that a space is a practiced place. And this, to me, implies both fluidity and, quite importantly, intentionality by its agents creating and maintaining a space. Though, of course, intentionality in creating a space won't be a universal practice. It may not be necessarily a conscious practice as well. So this room, for example, is a place. It's defined by four walls, the ceilings, the windows, and so forth. Movable furniture is variable, but at some point it was set up in the way that it was meant to be for this event today. So when we entered the room this morning, we made this a space. We defined this by our interactions with each other, by how we move, we create the space, moving the chairs around this morning in our conversations and so forth. And we are bound up again by temporality. We are done at five. We will leave this space. I imagine some of us will go to the other space of the pub, perhaps. <laughs> and with its more secure elements back, this will become a place again. So a space is a creation as much as an instable if fixed point. It's a lived experience at a particular moment with all of the contingent things. This is what I'm starting to call the curated space, the intentional conscious or subconscious representation of particular identities created by the objects, people, and places that create a space. And this, of course, then also makes a space a practice. It's one that's enacted by human and material agency, not just a temporal or a geographic location. So this is in part where the practice of spatial analysis, although Hillier and Hansen comes into play, their theory that buildings in and of themselves serve to organize the people and the space that it encloses. So this then folds into de Soto's theories, makes a building create both spaces and places. And I'm not going to dwell too much on Hillier and Hansen here. It's, it's a methodology of one of many that can be utilized, but I have to acknowledge it as a key part of, of my own approach. But here, I think, is where biography tends to start entering the picture. And biography can go by many names. I'm drawing, as I said, specifically on Harold Mighton's work in particular, although I'd be very quick to tell my colleagues in the history department that the approaches and practice are really quite similar to that of microhistory. In telling a building's biography, we aren't or we shouldn't be simply approaching the thing, but the sets of relationships that buildings create materially, physically, in terms of objects, people, and all of the interactions and intersections between them. So writing biography is in many ways no different than drawing together these varying and intersecting points of a time frame that create the lived experience. And from that can be drawn a greater meaning for greater historical understanding. A place can be the somewhat fixed point around which we build our historical narratives and as all good students of the past then, situate those experiences and narratives into a larger historical, historic, historiographical understanding of a larger social experience. And in the case of most of us in the room then, understanding Anglo-Saxon, Norman, and ultimately Anglo-Norman worlds of the very long 11th century. So this is where interdisciplinarity focused on the slightly longer term point of a building or a site gives us the approaches to understand a societal experience, and one that's not always passively received, but at times actively created, and created by the material world around the people of the past. So this is inevitably where some of my own practice has to be approached. I'll send you off in the direction of an article that I published in 2015 on the side of Thackham Netherton for a very specific and much longer biography of a place. And this is the late Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Norman excavated site in North, um, Northwest Hampshire. This is excavated and published by John Fairbrother in 1990. I approached this site through the interdisciplinary lens of biography in order to provide an interpretation of not just the site, but the lived experiences there from widows to slaves to a really surprising number of rebellious younger sons. In the 11th century specifically, we see a new building phase roughly identified from the reign of Knut into about 1102. And this encompasses the tenure of Lank de Lear, followed by Roger the Poitevin, who was the son of Roger of Montgomery. Now, the place was clearly occupied in the earlier phases of the site here. There's indication of coinage and so forth um, in, in, post, um, in the buildings. But it's also likely that Roger the Poitevin did not invest any time and energy in the place post-conquest until his own exile in 1102. So all identifiable works at this site, at this phase, can be identified to, to pre-1066. 
And in fact, Roger the Quadrivin was post-conquest attempting to holding on to his own after supporting Kurt Hose's rebellion against William I in 1088. And he was also attempting to significantly tie his northern properties with the Boleyn establishments in Normandy. So Hampshire wasn't his concern here at all. <coughs> and so in some ways, the Norman conquest is really rather a red herring in terms of the site. Although the building phase encompasses most of the 11th century, it's the agency of Lenk and his family that's our importance at this site. And within the framework of telling about Lenk and his probable <coughs> social standing via a biography of a place, we have then an experience that we can extrapolate out from any other number of lesser things in the late Anglo-Saxon period whose lives don't necessarily survive to us materially or textually. As the owners, ostensible occupiers of Thackham Everton at this time, Lank and his family, it's a wife and five known sons, would have occupied all of the spaces of the estate. We would find them in the high status areas, enacting their particular roles as the social elite there. Lank held property that was centralized in Hampshire, Berkshire, and Wiltshire area, where the three counties meet, with additional houses on Gear Street and Winchester, probably to access the royal court there. Lank's wife is unnamed, but she held property of her own in Berkshire as well. And despite his attesting no known charter, then it's possible that Lank had some localized power and possibly a position in the court of Edward the Confessor thanks to his relative wealth and land. This is a total of about 33 pounds in Doomsday Book. Now this is despite being technically classed as a middling class Ethane according to Corbett's reckoning. But this I think is a reminder that sometimes categorization of people according to wealth is a rather blunt tool. So we might think of Lank as being upwardly mobile, as little as we know about him from single sources. But his estates, his building program at Thackham Neverton, and more in combination, tell us a lot about being a lesser thane in the conquest period. More opportunities arise, I think, when thinking about a place, or at this point, buildings, as the starting points of research. In a piece that I hope to have out next year, a combination of place, so the buildings at Thackham Neverton, the small finds from the 10th century, and the lovely record of the will of Winfled will combine in a way that I will hope to allow me to create a social history of the late Anglo-Saxon household, by which I don't mean the social class that built the place, but those who lived and worked there all the same. So the slaves, the servants, the writing men, all evident in the material and the textual record. So this will be one of those points where some amount of uncertainty and flexibility must be allowed. There's no direct indication that people like Elfsiga the Cook, Yad Gifu the Weaver, or Elfa Gifu the Seamstress, who were all mentioned in Winfled's will, were actually at Fathom Netherton. But cooks, weavers, and more certainly were. The pins found to the east of the hall in this period, this is building nine on the schema, indicated to the excavator that maybe sewing is taking place here at this time, perhaps in the morning, to capture better light. So another temporally and spatially distinct space. The material remains of horse equipment and bones, as well as when floods bequest of trained and untrained horses, speaks perhaps of the riding men serving the estate as messengers, escorts, hunters, whilst trying to earn reward for their own benefit. So where are these people in our narratives and our biographies? Let's bring them to the forefront and let's try to create a broader whole of a space and a place anchored to these buildings and their times. So here essentially is my research agenda. I draw from disciplinary suggestions such as those from Guy Halsell, actually Martin Carver in the room as well, who have asked that we let our research questions set the agenda rather than our disciplines. And I approach my research questions hopefully with a strong framework first of understanding place and space within time to approach the materials, all of them, to tell the story of a space. Now it's worth saying I'm not a universalist. I understand the space within time I think is very crucial here. I do believe in reflective practice as a researcher. I think in, in sort of a postmodern interdisciplinary approach it is almost inevitable, but I'm also not a phenomenologist. So here I'm looking for the intersections, where the objects, the space place, and the text talk to each other and overlap, and try then to discern what that overlap means. And in my view, the curation of a space, the intentionality of the meaning of these intersections, are important to understanding the people in these spaces at these times. So I am seeking the curated space in the past. Kurt Vonnegut, one of my favorite writers, told us, we are what we pretend to be, so we must be careful about what we pretend to be. Now, our Anglo-Saxon and our Norman historical characters probably didn't have as much at stake as the fictional protagonist of Mother Night. He was a double agent between the Nazis and, and the US in World War II in the novel. 
But the expression here, I think, is what's important. We've long, expected, it, it, we've long accepted materiality and textual expression as a means of crafting identity, and whatever that identity means at particular times in particular places, so ergo spaces. When these come together, so a particular wall hanging for a certain gathering of things, a gold ring cup rather than a wooden one, chests and caskets in the hall securely symbolically closed and locked to withdraw items from view, a woman moving through the space offering hospitality, dressed in clothes with gold shot trim, the slaves and servants visually and symbolically <coughs> invisible with the upper class representing themselves as the embodiment of their social authority. This is a curated space. This is a space that gives a message and a meaning to those who encounter it. And it may be subconscious, but it certainly might have been and probably was intentional. Representative of who these people were in this space, who they're portraying themselves to be. This is the benefit, I think, to the approach. And these are the possibilities, I think, that lie looking beyond disciplines when looking at buildings. And these are the stories I hope that we can tell of buildings when viewed through interdisciplinarity. Thank you all very much. Thanks. I'll make Naomi earn her um, co-eyeship by uh, coming up to the question for this <laughs> session. Um, but if all the speakers can come up at once, we can collaborate as well.